Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. A significant portion of the third part of Immanuel Kant's prolegomena to any future metaphysics is taken up by the analysis of what Kant is going to call the dialectic of pure reason or the dialectical usage of pure reason, which for Kant is not a good thing. Dialectical, going astray, it's not as good as something that's actually secure and it's going to lead us into all sorts of errors. And so this is part of the critique of pure reason that is carried out in the, the work named as such and also here in the prolegomena in a much shorter form. So Kant is going to begin by drawing an analogy between the concepts of the uh, understanding, which we call categories, you know, and uh, the ideas of pure reason, also concepts, you know, for this faculty of, of reason. And he is going to tell us in section uh, 43 that in the critique of pure reason, I took care to endeavor not only to carefully distinguish several kinds of cognition, but to derive concepts belonging to each of them from their common source. I did that so that I could, by knowing where they originated, I could determine their use with safety and have this invaluable, but never previously anticipated advantage of knowing the completeness of my enumeration, classification, and specification of concepts a priori, right? Without this, metaphysics is mere rhapsody. Rhapsody is not a good term for Kant any more than dialectic is. So what's he going to do? He is going to look for clues, uh, just as he did with the concepts or categories of the uh, understanding. He's going to look for clues in logic for the ideas of reason. So he says, I found the origin of the categories in the four logical functions of all judgments of the understanding. So it was quite natural for me to seek the origin of the ideas in the three functions, function, of syllogisms. Now, he's, we're seeing the term syllogism being used in here, and we rightly associate that with logic and argumentation. Kant isn't actually using syllogismus in German. He's using a different term, vernunft, uh, schlüsse. Schluss means a conclusion, but it can also mean a process of uh, inquiry and inference, and it can mean syllogism because that's a particular kind of, of inference that's carried out going from premises to a conclusion. And for none of reason, right? So these are the, the inferences of reason. Syllogism works just fine, especially since Kant himself is going to be looking at logic, a topic that many are quite familiar with among his readership, and which he taught to students himself throughout the course of his long career. So the syllogisms are going to give us clues about how we can classify things. He says, as soon as these pure concepts of reason, that is the transcendental ideas are given, they could hardly, unless they be held innate, that's an idea that uh, rationalists had, about where our ideas come from, they could hardly be found anywhere else than in the same activity of reason, which so far as it regards mere form constitutes the logical element of syllogisms. The logical element of syllogisms is formal. It is not about the particular content. It's about the structure of how things are actually set up within the syllogisms. 
And then he says, uh, insofar as it represents judgments of the understanding as determined with respect to one or another form a priori, these constitute transcendental concepts of pure reason. So we got on the one hand, syllogisms, you know, whatever they happen to be. And on the other hand, we've got transcendental ideas of pure reason. And there is a correspondence between them, which we can effectively chart out a sort of mapping or uh, division uh, on each side following each other. So he tells us that the formal difference of syllogisms makes their division, their Unterschied, into three kinds, categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. So categorical syllogisms essentially tell us what, what something is, is, you know, uh, example of that, you know, all men are mortal, Socrates is man, therefore Socrates is mortal, right? I think that's pretty easy to wrap your head around. Hypothetical syllogism is going to involve a hypothesis, an if-then statement, right? So uh, if um, Socrates is uh, a man, then he is mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore he is mortal, right? And, you know, we could formalize this as, as a modus ponens, if P, then Q, uh, P, therefore Q. We can also have invalid uh, hypothetical syllogisms as well, and, and same thing with categorical syllogisms. So affirming the consequent, right? If P, then Q, Q, therefore P, right? It's certainly a hypothetical syllogism, but not a valid one. Kant's not worried about validity at this point. Then we have disjunctive syllogisms, and Kant actually has a very interesting footnote about this. So he says, in disjunctive judgments, we consider all possibility as divided in respect to a particular concept. We're saying something is this or it's this. It's not this, so it's this, right? So he says, uh, by the ontological principle of the thoroughgoing determination of a thing in general, I understand the principle that either the one or the other of all possible contradictory predicates must be assigned to any object. This is at the same time the principle of all disjunctive judgments, constituting the foundation of the totality of all possibility, and it's the possibility of every object in general is considered as determined. This may serve as a brief explanation of the above proposition that the, and here's the, the payoff, the activity of reason in disjunctive syllogisms is formally the same as that by which it fashions the idea of a totality of all reality, containing in itself the positive member of all contradictory predicates. So, you know, when we're thinking about just a plain old disjunctive syllogism, Socrates is mortal or he is immortal, right? Those are contradictory predicates. Socrates is not immortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's not about the entirety of, of the, you know, being as uh, such, but we could extend it formally into that, Kant says. And so here's where he's going to get his, his mileage, so to speak, out of this. So we've got these three functions of syllogisms, three kinds of syllogisms. And he's going to tell us the concepts of reason that are founded on these contain, therefore, three things. First, notice he begins by saying the idea of the complete vollständigen, this is a term that's going to be used in each of these, subject, subject, and he doesn't say substance, but rather the substantial, right? So we have an idea of a subject, of a complete subject, of a substance. Metaphysicians have been using this for uh, millennia, right? By the time that, that Kant is talking about this, so that's going to be one kind of idea or ideas, as we're going to come to in a moment. Secondly, the idea of the complete, once again, vollständigen, brought to its fruition, extended as far as possible, series of conditions, Reihe der Bedingungen, right? Con of conditioning, you could say, of one thing conditioning another, and just as this has to do with substance, this has to do with causality. 
right? Because what does a cause do? Well, it produces the effect, it brings it into existence, but it also conditions it, it specifies it, it makes it be what it is. That's why we call it a cause of that effect. So that, that corresponds to the hypothetical. Now, why does that correspond to the hypothetical? Uh, because, you know, you can set up, if the cause doesn't, doesn't exist, the effect doesn't exist. If the cause does exist, the effect does exist. There's a hypothetical connection between them. Then we get the disjunctive. Now, here's where it starts to get a little weird, right? So he says the determination, the bestimmung, a term that uh, was translated earlier as destination, and we could say harmony as well, or uh, resonance of all concepts, begefe, uh, in the idea of a complete, once again, vollständigen, complex, uh, in begriffs of what is possible, everything that is possible. So a determination of all concepts, all possible concepts in the idea of a complete complex uh, of what is possible. This corresponds to, you know, we've got substance, causality, community. Kant talks about that uh, quite a bit as well. So he goes on and then he's going to say there's another correspondence involved here. We can call the first the psychological idea here, but he's going to actually put that in the plural in the section. This is where it gets a little bit dicey because when you read that section, as we're going to look at elsewhere, it kind of appears as if there's only one psychological idea, but he does say the psychologia idean, right? So, you know, should that be plural or not? Uh, that's, that's a little bit debatable. Then under the hypothetical, the idea of the complete series of conditions dealing with cause and effect, the cosmological ideas, and the cosmological ideas do seem to be plural, don't they? then we have something that can't possibly be plural because it is uniting everything into one thing, not one thing, but one idea, the theological idea. And he's going to tell us a little bit about each of these in uh, section 44, right? He says uh, whether the soul is or is not a simple substance, that's something that we're going to look at under the psychological idea. Makes sense. Psuche is soul, right? Um, and then he goes on, likewise, the cosmological ideas of the beginning of the world or its eternity, right? He's also going to talk about causality, you know, whether we are free or not in that. And then he says, finally, uh, we have uh, the uh, design of nature is being drawn from the will of a supreme being. That would be uh, part of the theological idea right there, wouldn't it? So each of these is connected to a particular uh, kind of syllogism. Each of these is an idea. And here's the, the ultimate payoff of making all these distinctions. Each of these is a way in which reason, when it's not controlling itself critically, leads us astray and gives us bad metaphysics as a product of that. It generates illusions, errors that we can get drawn into. And Kant is going to call this the dialectic of pure reason, which much of this, this part of the prolegomena, as I mentioned earlier, is indeed about. So he's going to say each of these give occasion to dialectic each in its own way, and we have a division of the whole dialectic of pure reason into paralogism, uh, paralogismus, right, in, in German, antinomy, antinomy in, in German, and then ideal or ideal, it's just a cognate there. All of these are cognates, actually. So we have three different determinate modes of going astray. And really the antinomy is going to be itself plural. We have four of them discussed in that, that particular section, which takes up a significant portion of this part. 
And so he's going to say through this derivation, now here's where he's going to conclude, and this is quite important, we may feel assured that all of the claims of pure reason are completely represented. Vorgestellt, right? We are using representations of these and that none can be wanting or missing. Why? Because the faculty of reason itself, the capacity of reason, the Vermögen, really, Vernunft Vermögen is how it's, it's talked about in the German, from which they all take their origin, from which they all spring, right, is thereby completely surveyed, angemessen, right? So uh, literally measured out. We have exhaustively studied all the possibilities for how reason gets itself into these dialectical difficulties by taking as our leading cue or our path the distinction of these three different kinds of syllogisms. And so Kant, you know, he's showing you that what he's doing here is directly analogous to what he did with the understanding and the categories and logical judgments. He's doing that here with the uh, syllogisms or the uh, processes of inference of reason itself to show us where we aim at completeness. This you know, vollständigen, we aim at totality, at covering everything in a way that cannot be realized within the scope of experience and the understanding. Reason itself must be what engages in the study, the critical analysis of reason itself.